like I said, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, Sam, thank you so much for being here. Um, today we are going to uh, talk about uh, plan, scan, and deliver. I kind of wish we had like a little audio dub of sign, sealed, delivered uh, to like uh, play us some background okay. here. That would be nice. Plan, <laughs> scan, deliver. It'd be great. Um, but yeah, we don't. <laughs> so I'll do it on the fly. Um, quick uh, housekeeping stuff. All the participants are muted, uh, so uh, if you have questions, please ask them using the questions tool uh, in uh, GoToWebinar, so you'll find that little panel over on the side. You can go in and type in a question uh, or heckle uh, as you see fit. Uh, we will respond to the former and ignore the latter, uh, And uh, but please, please do communicate with us. Uh, Sam assured me that she's happy to get some questions during the presentation if anything comes up, so as you see something you've got a question plug it in we may or may not get to it um but uh eventually we will get to it um but uh please get those asked um at anything that we don't get to during the session we'll get to a q a at the end uh the webinar is being recorded so uh if you have to pop off or if you've got somebody uh in your company that you wish to have seen it um, just have them register, and once we actually post this online, uh, once the video goes live, uh, they'll, anybody that's registered will get that link. Uh, so just uh, pass it around, have people sign up, and then once the video's up there, they'll get it. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let's do some introductions here. So uh, with us today, we have Sam Hauk, and uh, Sam is the director of ScandaBim at uh, HailTip. Uh, she'll talk a little bit about what Hail Tip does in a minute here, but um, I've I've known Sam for a couple of years, uh, met her at several conferences. I know she's uh, been speaking at conferences, um, and uh, an active member of the uh, Association of Women in Construction and Women in BIM, um, which is awesome, and apparently is a big fan of Walk the Moon. I don't think I've seen. Yeah. In ten times in concert. That's that's not Sam. That's commitment. All right. A lot of them have been like festival situations, so they're not the only bands there. But you know, quite a bit. I think like twelve times now. Like oh, we need we need to update the slide. Apparently. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, excellent. Um, uh, I'm I'm sure either myself or Paula will hop on that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as for me, I'm just the MC today. Um, I'm completely unimportant as usual uh, and completely worthless as always, but uh, I will be here fielding questions. That is my sole purpose. Uh, otherwise, this is the Sam Houck show today, uh, which is going to be awesome. So thank you so much. And with that, I will uh, turn over the presentership here. Excellent. And you should be good to go, Sam. Just gotta make sure it's the right screen. Oops. Think we got this. Look at that. Perfect. All right. Great. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be doing a lot of talking. Feel free to, you know, like I said, uh send some questions my way or if you have a question, type up. Um, first of all, just a little bit about me. Um, my name's Sam. I have worked in BIM, VDC, and laser scanning for about eight years now. I've been at Hale for almost five, and um, I'm the scan to BIM director here. Uh, just a little bit about the company. Uh, we were established in 2014. We currently have 14 uh, employees, and we're based in Rochester, New York. So that's where I am in Rochester. Um, we've also got some employees in Buffalo as well as Arizona right now. Uh, we do work mostly in the US. A lot of our scan -to bim stuff is in the Northeast of the US. We do, we've done a little bit of international stuff, but definitely not the core of our work. Um, we do a variety of BIM, VDC, uh, you know, construction coordination, Revit modeling, and training in all of those aspects, including laser scanning and scan to bin modeling. Just a quick overview of what we're gonna run through today. So uh, basically, we're just gonna run through the different steps and stages of a the laser scanning portion of a scan to bin project. So planning, field operations, 
the registration and post-processing phase, and finally, delivery. So first of all, for planning, we need to collect the right data. So start with uh, existing building documentation. This will get directly from the client when they send you the RFP, um, or even just an email asking for uh, an estimate. So floor plans and reflective ceiling plans and other uh, plans, if they've got any elevations or anything, are definitely where you need to start. Uh, you can use those to get a good idea of the space. Mechanical plans are usually really helpful if it's a heavy mechanical space, uh, but architectural plans, at least to start. If they've got any photos, they can be really helpful. Google Maps and or satellite images can give you a good idea of what the site looks like and or what the roof looks like. They might have 3D models or past laser scan data, but I would say that's pretty uncommon. Um, you will use this data to estimate the job. You know, you can use your floor plans and your photos to do a time-based takeoff by literally calculating the number of setups that you think you're gonna have, or you can use historical data from past jobs. I will say I prefer to do the, the kind of time-based takeoff method, um, but we do keep records of all of our our estimates and how long it actually took us to, to collect data in order to take it off based on square footage and type of building alone. So you should be prepared to do that. Um, step two with planning stage, make sure you're asking the right questions. So basically you don't start with just what the client gave you. You have to ask a million more questions um, throughout the way. Uh, First of all, what will the client be using the data for? And a lot of people would say, well, they already know what they want. They've asked you for what they want, but you need to know what they're going to do with it because that will change in the, the method that you collect the data, the way you go about scanning. You know, If they're more interested in the mechanicals versus the architecture and the structure, you're gonna do setups in different places. So always ask them what their end goal is for the data because you might know something or be able to help them figure a better way to get the information that they need. Is there any above ceiling scanning or roof scanning? Do they want it in black and white or in color? Um, and then by getting the answers to all of these questions, you can start to figure out what different collection techniques you can be combined so that you get uh, the best data for them. So at Hale, we do a combination of things. We do terrestrial laser scanning, mobile laser scanning, 360 photos, as well as um, drone flights for photos and photogrammetry. So what is the best way to combine all of your um, building documentation techniques and methods in order to get them the data that they need? Um, next, you're gonna wanna ask them about the site requirements. Is there a required safety orientation? Um, what PPE is going to be required on site? Um, any COVID restrictions? And then, what can you do ahead of time? So if there are safety orientation classes or paperwork that needs to be filled out, can you do that before you get out there and speed up your um, process once you're on site? Um, where will your base of operations be? So we're talking more about large scale projects, which usually will take multiple days. So are you gonna store your equipment on the site overnight or are you gonna take it back to the hotel with you, back to your office? Um, where are you going to keep it? How are you going to keep it charged? And I recommend trying to find a place on site to keep it as a, a secure location um, that you can keep all of your equipment so that you do not have to pack and unpack every day. Uh, shift planning. So when will the work be completed? Can you do this all during normal business hours? Are there areas that are not accessible during certain times of day? When will you be doing the scanning? Um, a lot of our large scale jobs, we need to um, do second shift or night scanning sometimes. So, um, and finally access. Will you have access to all the areas or are you gonna need somebody to give you access? Are you gonna have to contact somebody every time you need a door unlocked? Are you gonna get your own key? Um, what, what kind of, I guess, limitations are you gonna have while you're on site? Um, sometimes you'll have somebody with you. Sometimes you'll need to call somebody to unload or unlock things. Um, also, where are your major, you know, connection access points? Stairwells between floors, um, maybe there's roof access you need to find. Just kind of basically, how are you going to navigate, not only navigate the building, but get all of the data that you need. 
and um, for planning as well, to have map it out. So basically, don't just go on your knowledge or know-how. Have a plan, map it out on a floor plan if you have one, um, and then set up a client meeting. So have a meeting with the client and the site owner if it's a different person, and basically review that plan and say, you know, these are the areas that we think we're going to have trouble getting into. What what can you guys tell us about this location that we don't already know that we should be aware of before we get out there? As well as establishing what time you're going to arrive, who you're going to contact when you get there, and where you're going to store and charge your equipment. So that's kind of the first map you have. You'll have the map to talk to the client and the manager before you go out, or the site manager before you go out on site and review the site and figure out kind of the logistics of what you're gonna do while you're there. And then the next map you wanna make is what we call a scan schedule. It's basically just another version of the floor plan. Hey, Sam. Um, and you guys, yep, go ahead. I just wanna jump in and say that like this, this is um, one of the things that is so often forgotten uh, on job site planning is where you store and charge the equipment, particularly the charging. Like I, I, I cannot, count how many times I've heard from somebody that they planned out their job you know, they put a lot of thought into it but they show up on site and there was nowhere for them to store or charge the equipment and then like you know all sorts of craziness ensues trying to find a spot and trying to do this and then you know half your day is gone and so like I, I just I love that that is such a critical point because uh, unfortunately battery life on on our equipment is uh, not multi-day uh, still so well, right. love that just wanted to chip in. Yeah, thank you. I agree. And there's a lot of other things that always come up in the client meetings that even though um, we we do very similar sites over and over again, each site is unique in some way. And the uh, site owner can give you a lot of insight into even just think questions like, where are you going to park? Um, stuff like that. So having that meeting before you get out there is pretty critical. Um, and then you take that information and you develop a plan, a schedule, or a scan plan for you and your team. So there's a lot of information that you and your team need to know that when you're on site that the um, you know, site manager might not really care about or they might not understand. So by creating a second version and mapping out where you're planning on scanning, having an idea of what days you're planning on doing which thing, um, that kind of idea. Um, laying out control points, so you might be putting your scan data on GPS or survey control. So where are you going to have those those target boards accessible um, for for um, for that? Or for instance, we do a combination of terrestrial scanning and mobile laser scanning. So we need to have um, common target boards in both sets of data in order to make sure that the data matches up. So we have to lay out where we are going to put those connection points so that we can get it in both the terrestrial scan data and the mobile scan data. And then also have a basic plan for how you're going to register this space before you go out. So what areas are you planning on scanning using targeted techniques? And what areas are you planning on scanning using cloud to cloud techniques? Um, and basically, how are you going to connect to the different areas? Because when you have a very large job, you don't scan it all in one line like you might for a smaller job where you everything's connected together. Um, you have to go to different areas at different times or different days. So what is going to be your method for connecting through you know, doorways, stairwells, um, things like that? And then use that scan schedule to have an internal scan planning meeting with your team. Um, prep all of your equipment. Make sure you have everything printed that you need. Where are you guys going to meet? Who's going to pack the car? Um, so on and so forth. So I'm going to kind of dive into what we were just talking about a little bit more um, and kind of go over an example of these types of documents that we use for our job. So a common scenario for us is a grocery store. So we do a lot of grocery stores, which are difficult. They take three days for a three-person team. Um, there's a lot of spaces that are occupied um, for the entire day, if not um, 24 hours. So there are certain things that we really need to plan out before we get out there. 
So this is an example of a grocery store that we've scanned in the past. And this would be the scan plan document that I bring to the store manager and the client before we go out into the field. So we've identified these problem areas that we have to plan out before we go out. Everything highlighted in blue is something that we've determined we need to do at night. So after 8 p.m. This is because there are all kitchens or um, bathrooms or you know, areas that have a high occupancy during the day. So for instance, the kitchen, they've got all of the people cooking back there. They've got um, you know, people cleaning there until 8 or 9 p.m. most days. So to also have a three-person scan team with all of our equipment and several ladders to open ceiling tiles, um, it's just too crowded and too complicated to try to do during the day. So we have to plan to do that at night. So I use this plan to talk to the solar manager and say, you know, what time can we get into these areas? Are there any days that you have something important going on that we cannot access a certain area? Um, some stores have, um, you know, like a pharmacy, for instance, which is another um, area that we need permission to access. The pharmacist has to be there to access them. So we discuss that with the store manager and say, you know, is there training going on one day where we won't be able to get into this area during a certain time or anything like that? So we use this map to cover all of those areas with um, the store manager. And I realize that this does not really translate to all jobs, but we do something similar for all of our other jobs as well. So for instance, we also do some food processing facilities. We will do a similar map and we'll talk to the um, super site supervisor and say, are there any areas that are you know, especially busy at certain times, um, loading docks, what time of day, do you have a lot of trucks coming through? Um, we'll avoid the areas during those busy times, that kind of thing. And then the second um, document I talked about was what we call the scan schedule. And this is the scan plan for the scanning team. So this is for the people who are going to be out in the field and it's mapping out basic general plan for the multiple days that you're there. Um, I guess one of the biggest points I can make is have a general schedule, but it will change. There's always something that happens. You do nothing ever goes to plan. So basically have an idea, you know, like day one, we're going to do, maybe you're going to do the exterior, the roof, and, you know, part of a, a main warehouse space. And then you get there and it's raining. So you can't do anything outside. Well, basically you just have to be prepared to, you know, do something you were gonna do on day two instead of day one. So have a basic plan, have an idea of how you want to um, map these out, but definitely be flexible. Um, so for this one, we've highlighted all of the areas that have drop ceilings. So we need to scan above the ceilings in all of these areas, which means that we need to use a terrestrial laser scanner to capture that data. Um, we do not do above ceiling scanning with our mobile laser scanner. So I've highlighted all of those and this is a good start for how we are going to plan to scan the store. Um, the other thing that we like to, to consider at this point is where we're gonna put those target boards. So what we end up doing is we kind of take our little target board marker and we identify locations where um, we're going to have overlapping data. So when, we, when we're scanning this store, we will plan to do several mobile scanning data sets. And we'll probably do kind of two across the main store, one across the front, one over here, and one in the back. So what are the connection points between these areas where we're going to have to have control to align our terrestrial laser scans with our mobile laser scans? Um, and I'm actually just gonna jump up over to our completed version of this. So what we've mapped out is how we are going to connect all of those above ceiling areas. Um, these yellow lines are how we're going to connect with a terrestrial laser scanner. We call it backbone scanning. So basically it's the idea we're minimizing our drift by closing our loops and we're connecting all of the areas that we need to do terrestrial laser scanning. So we've got one big loop where we've closed everything around, and then we've also got this connection across the middle. 
So that's really going to keep all of our data nice and tight, minimize all the drift in our terrestrial data and the registration process after. Um, and then we will um, also use these to capture those target boards I was talking about. And we get our XYZ coordinates from our terrestrial scan data and apply it to our mobile scanning data. The other option would be to get survey control on each of these and apply it to both. Um, but we need a target board in every, at least four or five in every mobile um, data set, as well as we need to capture every single target board with the terrestrial scanner. So that's what this is. And then finally, we've also identified important things that the laser scanning team is going to need to remember to do. So we've identified a roof access point. This is where you're going to need to access the penthouses on the roof. Um, we're going to need to get this door unlocked by the security team so that we can um, connect the exterior data set. We do a mobile laser scan around the exterior of the building. They can come in this door and get that target board. Same thing on this end. So we identify those things that are going to be like an extra step for the field team. What do they need to remember to do while they're out there? And we put it all on one sheet and then we print this out and we take it out into the field and then everyone has this with them. They know where they're gonna be scanning, where the target boards are and what they need to get security and or the manager at the store to do for them while they're there. So I know that was like a lot of information, but um, that's the basic way that we plan out our scan jobs and the documents that we use to make sure we don't forget anything while we're out there. And this is all done before we even leave the office. So let's hop back over here. And now we get to actually go out and do it. <laughs> so step two is the field operations, the data collection. Um, I kind of split this into a couple different parts. Um, first of all, managing your team, your people, and your resources, your equipment. So, um, just some questions and things that you should be asking while you're out in the field. Um, what areas and or tasks can be completed by teams versus one person? So like I said, we have a three person team that we send out. We've got three terrestrial laser scanners, one mobile laser scanner, several 360 cameras and one drone. So if we are collecting all of that data for one site, how are you going to pair up your team the best in order to be the most productive? So when we're doing above ceiling scanning, you need at least two people with two scanners together because somebody has to be opening the tiles and putting a scanner above the ceiling. And another person has to be putting a scanner on the ground below those open tiles. So those are two person tasks. Things like taking 360 photos can be done by a single person. So managing your team in such a way where everyone is being productive um, in teams or maybe all three people working together at the same time. Um, or if, if there's not enough work for all three people, what's something that a single person can do on their own? Make sure you're keeping your equipment charged and accessible. So if you have it stored on site, it's really easy. You just charge your equipment in the same room. Um, make sure that you're charging your batteries as soon as you put a new one um, in. So if you just switch out the battery, start charging it immediately so it's charged back up when the new battery dies. Um, make sure you're taking breaks. So we do three days. There's sometimes there are longer shifts, so they could be like three nine hour shifts. Um, that's a lot of walking around, standing and scanning. So make sure that your team are taking breaks. Um, I like to have a longer break almost every day where the team can get dinner together or just sit together and recharge and connect as a team. And then um, for smaller breaks, I like to stagger them so that two people continue working while one person gets to take their, their coffee break or, or whatever. So um, you're continuing to be productive even though people um, need to sit out for a while. Um, finally, plan for the areas that require the most coordination first. So I mentioned the pharmacy earlier. That is kind of a, an issue at a lot of our a lot of our grocery stores because the pharmacist needs to be there when you're scanning it um, legally. You can't go back there without a pharmacist. So um, how do we plan that out so that they know we're coming and we're not in their way? So what we do is we stop in and we talk to the pharmacist 
right when they arrive and we say we're going to be here for the next three days what time over that is the, that those three days is the best time for us to come back and scan this and we will kind of plan the rest of the store around that the other thing is weather so make sure you have an eye on the weather what day are you going to do any exterior work um, because the weather um, can affect that uh, step two, tracking your data. So how do you keep track of where you've been, where you're going, who's collected what? Um, so we've got that overall plan, that scan schedule that we created. We have that out in the fields with us. We also have blank um, scan maps printed for every area of the store, especially the areas with those above and below ceiling tiles. Um, and we write down every single scan that we take and where it is. We also write down the numbers and the location of every single one of those target boards that we put up um, and just keep track of exact literally every single scan that we've taken and it sounds tedious but it's it's very important um, I've got this note on here paper versus digital so I have personally prefer um, doing it on paper a large 11 by 17 floor plan with pens and the clipboard um, but we do have some people that prefer to take out an iPad and do it on an iPad. Um, I just have nothing but issues with whenever I try to use the iPad. And it's another kind of expensive thing that I have to carry it around. So I prefer the paper. Um, but we do convert our paper maps into digital ones once we're back in the office. Also use your scan maps to take notes. What areas were scanned um, using targets? and or target boards and what areas are intended for cloud to cloud registration. Make sure you're also tracking your progress on your other data collection techniques. So for our mobile laser scans, we have another floor plan that we highlight off areas that we've already scanned and make sure that you're uploading 360 photos so that we can keep track of where photos have been taken. Also, keep track of how long everything takes because you can use that later on in your estimating um, for future jobs. Um, finally, before you leave the site, make sure you're verifying all your information. So take, you know, a half an hour before, while your team is packing up or whatever, and review all of the scan maps and all of your documents to make sure that you've actually um, gotten everything that you need. With a large scale job like this, when you're jumping around between different areas, it's really easy to miss something. So do you have a scan taken in front of every single one of those target boards? Do you, did you take all of your mobile laser scanning data sets or maybe you missed one? So just take a little bit of extra time to review everything before you leave the site. And then don't take those target boards down until you sure, you're sure that you have everything. Um, check your data. So at the end of every shift or at the end of every day, um, load and save your scans into your registration software. Make sure that there's no errors in the data. Um, SD card hasn't gotten corrupted, anything like that. Um, check the previews for your mobile laser scans. Make sure that you don't have any slam breaks or um, you know miss any data, and confirm that your 360 photos are uploaded. If you got a drone flight, you know make sure that the SD card saved all the photos, that kind of stuff. So just making sure you have everything before you leave, especially if you travel to get there. Uh, step three registration and post-processing. So I have, have a plan. So don't just start registering. Um, when you have a large job like this, and we talked about how it's broken down into different areas, it really becomes kind of a conglomerate of lots of little projects that you end up having to bring together. Um, so you really need to plan what that final step is. How are you going to match all of these scans together? An extra couple hours, and I do think it will take a couple hours for a large like, job this size, planning out exactly how you're going to bring everything together will save you days of time later. I've been on lots of projects where it doesn't get planned out in the beginning, and then at the end, you're like pulling your clusters apart and just everything falling apart at the end. So definitely take some time in the beginning, plan it out, map it out, and you'll just be thankful for it later. So use your field maps um, and your notes and everything to just plan how you're gonna uh, register it all together. Think of it as a puzzle. So think of each 
area that was scanned at the same time as a different piece? And then how are you going to match those pieces together? Um, I think the best way is to plan that final registration to be a targeted registration. It's quicker, it's easier to QC. Um, it's, I just prefer it um, quite a lot. So what I mean by that is say that you have a, an area that was scanned with cloud to cloud registration, turn that into a targeted cluster by having a, an adjacent targeted um, area where you pull that targeted scan in and you cloud to cloud it in with your cloud to cloud puzzle piece. Um, and then now that is a targeted piece and you can target it to the adjacent scan. Um, and then you're also going to think about the order that you need to post process your data in. So for us, like I said, we use our terrestrial laser scans as our control network. So we need to register all of our terrestrial laser scans before we can um, start processing our mobile laser scans for our drone flight. All right, so let's come back over to our PDFs here. So this is the same store, and it's just the final scan map from that store. So we went out, we scanned it. Um, each of the circles is a, a ground scan, and each of the squares is a scan above the ceiling. Also, we've identified areas that were scanned cloud to cloud. So you can see this entire um, area here was done cloud to cloud, as well as, you know, areas where there's a lot of customers and things and we can't put spheres out. Um, so we've got all that information in our one file. I'm gonna concentrate on one small area of this because too much to try to look at the whole store. Um, so let's look at this, we call it the back of house. So it's like the storage area, receiving, that kind of stuff. So if we look at this back of house area, just kind of section it off like this. Not going to include that spot. We're basically just looking at this. And this is actually kind of a smaller version of the project as a whole, because this was not all scanned at one time. You can kind of see by the scan numbers that there was a scan done that kind of goes across the space and connects one side and the middle to each other. And then there is this area that was all scanned at one time, but a much different time than the scan through the hallway, as well as this area was scanned at a different time and this little office here. So each of those is like their own little mini project that was done at a different time. And finally, there's one over here. And we've got this one in the corner that was done cloud to cloud. And then everything else looks like it was done targeted. So. The first step to bringing this all together is to register each of these pieces. So we've got this cluster, this cluster, five clusters total, one, two, three, four, and then the hallway. And we use Ferrocene, um, but you know any registration software will do. And I have gone ahead and I've done that. So I have each of those clusters registered. They're not registered to each other, they're all their own individual projects at this point. So if I had gone ahead and registered this without doing any planning, um, setting up that plan map at the beginning, um, this is what I would end up with, five separate clusters. And it's like, okay, how am I gonna bring this together? Um, I guess I have to cloud the cloud them. Uh, so I would have to you know, manually align everything. Do, do, do to each other, um, I'm disoriented. I don't really know how these go, to be honest. So I can't, I think it's upside down. But 
you could do that. But cloud to cloud registration takes a long time compared to targeted registration. Um, the process itself, it takes a lot of processing power. Um, if it screws up, you got to do it again. And it's going to take just as long to do that. So say you cloud to clouded this and it, one of the things did not come together right. I still have to rerun the whole process. And each time, if it takes 10 minutes and I rerun it three times, that's 30 minutes of just time waiting for my computer to process this. And this is actually just a small portion of the data. Um, if I was gonna do that for the whole store, you can multiply that by you know, multiple times. Um, so instead, what I recommend that you do is plan out, like I was saying, so that that last registration function is targeted. So starting on this side, if we look at this cluster, we've got a scan in the doorway that was taken for the sole purpose of connecting into the hallway. But there are no targets between this scan and this scan. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to take this scan and I'm gonna cloud to cloud it with A2. So A2 is a targeted scan to A3 and A32 is a targeted scan with A131. And usually how I designate that for myself is I make a yellow line and I just draw a line between the scans that are connected. So now I've got a small cloud to cloud cluster here of just these two and that single cluster has a connection this way and this way. So if we continue down the line, I actually know my project only has this room in it. Um, and identify those other locations. So if I do these two together, I'm going to target those scans. And then continuing down, if I do this one and this one. And finally, over here, I've got a large cloud to cloud cluster. So that's already cloud to clouded together. But if I pull one more scan into it, I can make it targeted. So I can pull A14 in, and then now I have a targeted connection between this um, cluster and the um, main hallway here. So if we jump back over to our scene file, and I open a version of the project where um, I did organize that ahead of time so that I have those scans pulled in. You can see that for each of those areas um, that was scanned at a different time, I've had, I have a small cloud to cloud cluster that pulls in one scan from the hallway. So we've got one small cluster that connects, or in this case two, because there's two doorways, that connects the hallway into that kind of side space. So now when I run this, it is a target-based function. It takes seconds to run. For a large project, if you're gonna do the whole store, it might take a couple minutes um, or so. We have connections with all of those spaces, but it's targeted. So this is easier to QC um, because I have the target tension. Also, uh, obviously it's it comes together on its own. You also see that I pulled out that hallway, so it's not its own cluster. It's not one big puzzle piece, and it, they are single scans, um, allowing it to kind of um, press any error through the space instead of keeping it all together as one. So that's kind of the method I recommend for planning out your registration um, and having a plan so that that final piece is really easy to match because all I had to do was make a targeted connection between two scans for each of these um, kind of side spaces that were scanned at a different time. And then if you're kind of looking at the, at the store as a whole, we've also got connections in each of the doorways between the back of the house and the store, as well as like, for instance, the pharmacy was done at a different time than the store. So we've got these scans from the pharmacy that are pulled and connected in with the rest of the store. Um, so obviously once you get bigger, it gets more and more complicated, but that kind of small example is a good start.
for how I would do it. All right. So Sam, Sam, we've got a couple questions from this section that that I, I want to go ahead and pull up. Um, Definitely. So, so first is um, which mobile scanners are are you using, and what's the most kind of optimal distance time uh, and time to walk a loop? So we use a Navis VLX, and the data sets we find that keeping them about forty five minutes or less is is optimal. Um, actually, sometimes we try to even go a little bit lower when you're in open spaces or an exterior. Um, kind of that 30 minute mark is where it starts to get a little cranky. Um, so, so generally, 30 to 45 minutes um, is the longest that we go. So we have to break it up into um, sections that are about that long. All right, and then a kind of a follow on to that. Um, what's the minimum recommended amount of control points that should be covered in your mobile scan? Um, you know, I, they're, they're assuming cloud to cloud registration is not recommended for mobile scans to get them into, uh, to get them into the project's control network. But that may or may not be true. Well, it, it's complicated because um, the registration software is different and I'm sure it depends on which mobile scanner you use. But we don't have a scan file that we pull in and register with our other scans. We are depending on the control point to do that. Um, so for us, we have, I would say, at least four in each set. And we have them in locations where we have overlapping data. Um, and we tend to try to have them spread out, so not all in one spot. But more is never worse, for sure. So having more than that. I would say a minimum of three, um, basically basic rule of triangulation, having three, um, three unique points will give you kind of your orientation and rotation that, that you want. Um, but that's what we, we usually do around, I would say five to eight in each of our data sets. All right, thanks, thanks. And that's, 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 I think key thing there is like you, know, you need you need two or three. Well, I think the minimum you technically need in order to get an actual result is two. Three gives you one redundant, which allows you to check data across those. And then obviously every additional one above that, you get additional redundancy. It gives you the ability to find sources of error, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's uh, that's great advice. Sorry for interrupting. No, not at all. I'm kind of getting sick of my own voice, so it's good timing. <laughs> um, and then, so along with that registration piece, um, we have divide and conquer. So when you have a large project, uh, obviously, you can take a long time to register it. So our general rule of thumb is that it takes about as long as it took to collect the data to register it and clean it and bring it all together. Um, so if you've got three people in the field for three days, uh, that's over a week's worth of time for just one person to register this. So since it is already broken up into kind of clusters based on when things were scanned, once you've planned out how you're going to bring everything back together and organize your data, you can kick out each of those um, puzzle pieces, clusters, to different people. Um, that's going to be dependent on how many software licenses you have and you know the number of people you have and that kind of thing but dividing the work will make it go much faster you will have to identify kind of the point person who will be responsible for bringing that all back together cleaning it creating the recap file and then um, pulling out those control points so we use our tls data as our control so we match it to a local coordinate system usually a model that we have available that we're trying to um, update or model um, using our scan data. So we will orient and locate our uh, terrestrial laser scans, and then we will pull those control points from that data and apply it to our other data. Um, so that's stuff that we have to do. And then once we have those control points, we have to identify somebody to register the mobile laser scans, as well as if we have a drone flight they have to um, do the photogrammetry on control for the drone. Um, and so you kind of just start splitting off all those duties so that 
you can get it done as quickly as possible. Um, how are you going to transfer the data back and forth between your team? Are you going to use kind of like Dropbox or a network server, or are you going to physically be in the same space and use a hard drive to um, pass it back and forth? Uh, a three-day scanning job can be hundreds of gigs of data. So how are you going to transfer all of that out around? Um, and then finally, set goals or expectations for your team. Um, with large projects, it can be really easy to kind of spread it out. So kind of set how long you think things should take and have um, regular meetings to kind of group back up and see where everyone's at and talk about how you're going to bring everything back together. And then the final step, um, delivery. So what are you delivering to the client? Um, often it's a variety of things for us. We have the point clouds, which are both the terrestrial laser scans as well as the mobile laser scans. Um, we have online tours and 360 photo walkthroughs. We have UAS photos. We've got maybe a Revit model or an Avisworks model. How are we going to get all of this to them? Um, and what is the most efficient way to get it to them? So do they need the structured data? Do they need the very large recap file with all of the um, viewpoints? Or can we give them um, the unified data, unstructured data that's smaller and easier to digest? Usually we give them a combination of both. Um, are you going to deliver it via like a web hosted site like Sintu? Um, or are you just gonna send them links to download it from like Box or Google Drive? Um, how, how are you gonna get it to them? And that is something that you have to plan out because for a large job like this, uh, the structured recap file or even the limited uh, terrestrial scans that we do can be upwards of like 100 gigs. And then you've got another 50 gigs of unified scan files. So it's just a lot of data to figure out how you're gonna to get to them. Um, so have a plan for that. And then also, how are you going to make the data accessible, usable, and digestible for the client? So we like to include a scan map, like a cleaned version of the scan map that shows where all the scans are, as well as um, how we've broken it up. So when we create those smaller unified files, we'll break it up into pieces so that they're smaller files they can bring into Revit or Navisworks and hide different areas of the store. Um, send upload or download instructions. So if you're going to send them a link to Sintu, for instance, and you expect them to download the data, tell them how to do that. Um, give them, uh, we have a PDF that we give them that says, this is how you're gonna get your data. And then finally, have a meeting with them to go over everything that you're giving them and how they can use it. Some of your clients will know how they've been doing this for a while, but especially for a new client, definitely have a meeting with them, share the screen, share your data, show them exactly what they're getting and how they can use it. This is just an example of that final scan map. Um, we show them all the scan locations and what they mean as well as how we've broken out those unified files. So we'll break it down into smaller file sizes so that more computers can handle it. And I think that's the end. <laughs> that's fantastic. Man, right on time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done. Um, awesome. Um, well, I, I'd say, you know, if, uh, if anybody has any more questions, please pop those in the questions panel of the GoToWebinar. And uh, if anybody wants to dig into something, um, uh, getting a little bit of feedback, uh, thank you for the feedback, uh, Luan uh, said, uh, great presentation, great, uh, uh, great information. So, um, fabulous. So I, you know, I, I'm just kind of thinking about questions that I've got. Um, like uh, w one of the things I really always, you know, found to be such a pain point on projects was getting that delivery um, and getting the delivery right. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this comes back to the client meetings that you talked about and the kind of that early, early pre-planning on the job, but just understanding what are the formats they need? How do they need it broken up? How do, you know, the, you know, early on when we were starting out doing scan to BIM, um, it was just like, I felt like, we would turn over the project and then we'd turn it over again and then we'd turn it over again <laughs> and it would take three or four or five iterations of sending the client data 
um, to actually get the format right for what they needed, get it broken up the way they actually wanted. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, you know, what kind of questions are you asking the client early on in the project to figure that out up front so that hopefully that delivery process goes more smoothly? Yeah, um, so knowing what they wanna do with the data is really important. Um, are they going to model from it? Are they gonna bring it into Revit? Um, unified data is better for that, in my opinion. Um, so having a unified point cloud file or multiple unified point cloud files, if that's their goal, um, is great. I will say often we just give them everything and we say we recommend using these files for now this works in Revit. We recognize you, or recommend using this file if you're going to be using Recap um, because it has the real views in it. And we send them the VLX box through as well, but we only host that for a limited period of time. Um, so really, yeah, just knowing what they're going to do with it and then you can recommend what file types to use. A lot of times they don't even really know how to use the point cloud or what it is. So you might need to tell them what they need. And if they are that type of client, then they will want the um, structured file probably for like archiving of their records, but I doubt they ever even really look at it. So just kind of knowing what, what they're gonna want, and not what they want, but what they wanna do with it will tell you what they need that file type to be. Gotcha, so <clears throat> apply your own experience for what will be best in those applications to uh, figure it out rather than having them say, we want this type of file. Uh, yeah, awesome. and unfortunately, it's a lot of times, it's, I mean, they just don't know. So like we have another client who reached out to us recently and they want to um, not quite have a survey of a site, but basically just there's several buildings, they wanna know where the buildings are and they're like, we think you could mobile scan this. And they're like, no. We actually think that we should fly the drone um, because we can cover more area with a similar um, accuracy and uh, less slam break. <laughs> so we're we're basically like, well, kind of, but we think you should do this. Um, and I think it works really well usually, and and clients like that um, because they they understand that you have the expertise to tell them what's better for them. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Peter Fisher here. Um, what scale of project should one consider that scan to BIM is a cost-effective solution for? Uh, all of them, honestly. Um, so, I mean, I guess it depends on, again, what you're using the data for. So these grocery stores are using it as their as built. So they are scanning the entire store just one time. Um, and then they know exactly where everything is. And if they're ever going to change anything, they only need to scan one spot um, again. And again, it takes three people three days. So it's not inexpensive by any means, but they, they not want to know where everything is. They want to know exactly how it was installed. Um, so for them, it is cost effective. Um, I would say most projects could use some sort of laser scanning, um, especially if it's a renovation. Uh, nothing is ever documented exactly how it is and i've done a lot of coordination projects where you know the, they say there's a 10 inch beam here well it's a 24 inch beam so i don't know how you're going to fit a 30 inch duct under that 24 inch beam but now we know it's there um, and we can figure it out so that's a tough question to answer yeah <laughs> no, I, I i i love it but i i think you know it was one of those things where like um you know, 10 years ago when I first got started in this business, there were definitely projects that just did not make sense. Um, whether it was scale or, you know, use case related, you know, kind of depends, but I, I feel like we've kind of, you know, probably four or five years ago crossed that bridge because, you know, with the cost of the scanners coming down, um, the ability, you know, also just the productivity of the scanners going up at the same time. And it was really those two things, those two trends, you know, being able to get a, you know, uh, thirty to forty thousand dollar laser scanner that can crank out a hundred scans in a day. Uh, you know, change things a lot. And and I think you know, you guys are using the VLX. There's a couple other really great solutions out there on the mobile space. But um, mobile scanning, you know, just has done that yet again. Maybe not on the reduction of cost side, but yeah. uh, certainly on the productivity side. And so, if that fits within your accuracy profile, you know, mobile scanning has really opened up. 
uh, you know, to a much broader extent, um, you know, where reality capture can actually be cost effective for projects. But there's that accuracy component still, um, you know, particularly on global accuracy uh, yeah. to make sure that that information is correct. And that takes a lot of expertise and knowledge. So it's not like anybody can just go out and do it. Um, but if you've got the expertise and knowledge, you know, uh, it, it's it's radically different than it was 10 years ago when I felt like, you know, the first question I always had to figure out was, does it even make sense? And at, at mm -hmm. this point, in most cases, I walk in with the assumption that it makes sense. It's, it's just a question of, do you have it in the budget? Which is very, you know, I think, you know, one of one of the frustrations that I hear a lot from people is the question of whether it's in the budget is very different from the question of, is it cost effective for the job? Yeah. Because a lot of times when something is cost effective for the job overall, and it would probably save the job money overall, but it's not specifically in the budget. And so you have to take money from something else that you're hoping to save money on with it to pay for the cost of the scanning. That's always yeah. that's always a difficult argument, but very rarely if you, you know, figure out how to do it and you do it, I, I, I can't think of any you know, occasions where there hasn't been something that somebody found that was like, oh my God, I'm so glad we did this, you know? Yeah, I feel like it's kind of, it's what you were saying about budget. So it's like where you spend the money. So if they scan at the right time um, before, you know, you really get started, especially if you're doing any sort of digital coordination, um, you will save time and money in the construction. Without a doubt, I haven't seen a project that hasn't had that happen um so it's kind of just like if you didn't spend the money on scanning it earlier on you're probably going to spend it on field changes when they're actually doing the building yeah i i, I can in every single occasion where i ran into a project where somebody was like well, we just don't have it in the budget nine months later i came back to that job ended up doing scanning anyway <laughs> <laughs> they spent more money dealing with the problem that they could have found nine months prior and, and you know yeah. and every time they're like oh i wish we just scanned it nine months ago and you're just like yeah and i will say it's hard to go without it once you've had it so i mean yeah. a lot of our clients are repeat clients so once once they have it they realize the value of it and continue to ask for it so all right um excellent so I think we've got one last question here and then we will call it. Um, let's see, what would you consider the real ROI when implementing scan to BIM on a project? So I think we touched on it lightly, but like what are, what are you know, a couple of examples of that true return on investment for the, you know, $20,000, $30,000 somebody spends on, on scanning and getting an ass built? Um, I mean, well, a lot of our clients are the designers or like, so it's before, you know, pretty far before. So just having accurate data for the current setup of the building, um, it can be very useful. They're going to have to model it anyway. So it's just a matter of if it's modeled to real world conditions or if it's, if it's modeled with a tape measure. Um, as far as an actual number, I can't really give that to you because we're we're not the people using it at the end. Unfortunately, we're the people we're just giving it away. <laughs> yeah, but so the 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 example I always give is that nobody has the money to do something uh, right the first time, but they always have the money to do it twice. Uh, you know, which makes no sense because it always costs more to do it twice. Um, and so whether it's the design, whether it's you know fabrication, installation of work in the field. And I, I think in general, you know, the the it's hard to predict the ROI on any given project because you don't know what's wrong before you do the scan. Mm -hmm. uh, but but yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I can really like dredging through the past. I can think of one project where we went out and did a scan, and we were shocked and amazed how good the existing drawings were. And probably the scan wasn't worth it on that one job. Probably. It was close. Like that job, it was like debatable whether it was actually worth the money spent. That was on like a job that was built 150 years ago. 
and yeah. like it was extremely meticulously documented. There had been no changes in 150 years, and it was historic preservation. And it was like, and it was just really good documentation. The building was really well built, and that's, that's happened exciting. in my <laughs> entire career one time on every other project, whether it was discovering things were just not in the right place and you know, not having built an entire design around a very incorrect as built and then having to redesign and then redesign and send change orders and do all this other stuff. Um, some of which will get approved, some of which won't, um, you know, or, you know, particularly out in the field, like the, the example of being like, I cannot tell you how often beam spacing, beam depth, you know, penetrations, whatever it is, the stuff that's supposed to be there just in there, or it's totally different. Right. Uh, and it just and we found out that um on a new job so they were installing new steel the columns were a foot off um from where they were supposed to be and that obviously changes everything so um that's another like that was an in progress job not even uh as built situation yeah i mean like i i, I remember a, a project in dallas that we worked on and uh they had they had they had taken this huge project with an underground parking garage with a bunch of buildings on top of it. And they were having to do a huge renovation and they wanted to add a bunch of trees to the kind of groundscape, which meant, you know, finding places where they could cut a hole in the slab uh, safely, drop in a tree well, you know, put it in structurally, seal it off. And they, they designed the entire project, like 700 something, you know, tree wells and modifications to this deck. Um, they designed the whole thing off the drawings. And then we went out and scanned it, you know, and everybody was like, well, it's probably not worth it. We went out and scanned it, and the structure was actually built completely differently from those drawings because it was okay. built. It was like bas basically the drawings were like the early design drawings. That's what they had. And then what happened is they hired somebody to go out, and it was a an engineered system that got redesigned and installed in the field, and it was just different. And so they had to completely redesign the entire the entire project, soup to nuts for the groundscape. And it was like, you know, probably took us, uh, it took us like four or five days to scan the whole thing. It was probably a twenty to $30,000 job. And they had like $180,000 of redesign fees. Wow, okay. <laughs> you know, they just scanned it first, you know, <laughs> get it designed it right the first time. So I just, I, I can think of like, 50 examples off the top of my head of those kind of situations. So that's where the ROI comes in, um, Peter. Um, we are a little past time, so we're definitely gonna close it out. Um, Sam, thank you so much for joining us and sharing today, really appreciate it. Um, obviously, uh, um, uh, I'm sure you're fine with people reaching out to you on LinkedIn. Um, uh, we've, we've got all that information when we post the video um which will be in about a week uh please feel free to share that out anybody that you think should see this uh you can share the registration link uh, they can register i know it's already happened but uh they will then get the video link um but uh but yeah thank you to all of our wonderful attendees thank you sam uh, and thanks to our uh, marketing team for pulling all this together thanks uh, paula and the other sam <laughs> all right yeah, thank you See you next time. Next time. All right.